two pieces of advice you'd give from someone who's suffering from the are you hurt or are you injured mentality? Uh, it doesn't matter because neither one feels good. So do what's best for you in the end. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> is that all the advice because i was like all of a mic drop that was, that was a lot I, mean, I don't know what else to add to that like you know putting you first that everybody else is putting themselves first so you might as well do what you need to do for you mm-hmm. and looking back at how far you've come what does being proud of yourself look like now Um, I am most proud of myself when I do something that I believe that I cannot do. Is there a technique that you recommend for cleaning cloth? Well, like for these. the big brush, you use that for the bigger parts, so you're already off to a great start. <laughs> um, you can really go as hard as you want to on that. Usually when they make these cloth materials, they understand that you're going to be going through some stuff. <laughs> so you don't got to worry about that for real, for real. I usually tell folks, just go ham. Just just do how you usually would. And for someone who obviously doesn't usually clean their shoes, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, newer experiences. Yeah. It really comes down to what would you consider your shoe being clean? What would I consider it being clean? Mm -hmm. Like, from everything that I've done look-wise, these are... I look like, I feel like I've done a great job of cleaning these shoes. Mm. So that would be the measure. You are the measure of, ooh, this cleaned well, or ooh, I got that stain that I've been looking at for quite some time. Yeah. Goodbye, stains. Goodbye, stain. What's your concoction? What do you put in your ear? And... I don't advertise the company because they don't pay me money yet, but this right. is the product that I used. Okay. That's in there. That's the company. If you ever look them up, yeah. Okay. Bet this is this is them right here. I'm gonna put it back now because they're not paying me. I was wondering if you had some old school like shout plus tide plus some um, oxyclean or some type of formula for you. I had, I've had some folks that have talked to me about their old school concoctions and I told mm-hmm. them they need to bring that old school concoction to my place of residence in order to do one of these these <laughs> interviews. And we all love a little concoction. <laughs> Look at them go. <laughs> Out there concocting. <laughs> your, your little mix. Getting it right the first time. I've had someone on YouTube say, you really got people out here cleaning the bottom of your sneakers? That's crazy. He's cleaning the bottom of his sneakers. Look at this guy cleaning the bottom of his sneakers. I didn't notice that, though, when I was watching. <laughs> like, and I was oh, like... Man. You're cleaning a shoe. Why wouldn't you clean the bottom of your shoe if you're cleaning a shoe? It's Dirt at the bottom of your shoe doesn't add character to the shoe. Well, people only care about what people can see. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, oh, bars, <laughs> bars, <laughs> mic <Might> drop. <laughs> Keeping up with the jokes. <laughs> 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 Yeah, so <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> yeah, that my bad, my bad. I interrupted what some you of that actually, about. though. No, we can just keep flowing. Mm-hmm. Some of that actually played into my choice of shoe today. Okay, I was like, hmm, in the past, I've seen a lot of stylish, fashionable shoes. Mm-hmm. Maybe I should go with the Air Maxes so that I don't look like a cornball. Is it? But then I was like, that's not really authentic to me. I'm going to go with what makes me comfortable. Okay. So So what makes you comfortable then since we're here? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, like you said before, I stand all day. I walk a lot. And so 
I need something that's going to support my ankles. Yeah. That's important. I need something that's going to um, support my arches. Uh huh. Because I do have high arches. Okay. Um, and I find that the fashion sneakers typically. They're cute, but they can be restrictive in some ways. Like at the end of the day, my foot feels like it's been squeezed for the entire day. Mm-hmm. Um, or my ankle might just have that little tinge in the back, you know? Yeah. Um, and so comfort is way more important to me than style. Um, yeah. Have you always been a comfort person? No. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, I think my childhood and the way that the people that I was raised by, probably my dad mostly, mm-hmm. taught me that you're supposed to suck it up. Just like, you know, he used to have this, his saying was, are you injured or are you hurt? Mm-hmm. God dang. What, what was the first, what, what, at what age was the first time he said that? Um... It, my childhood all kind of blends together, but mm-hmm. my earliest memories are probably around like eight. Because we used to play basketball. We had a basketball court, or yeah, a basketball court in front of our house. And he's a basketball enthusiast. He played college and, mm-hmm. you know, thought he was going to the NBA. Um, that's an enthusiast. And so that's where, that's where some of his... Uh, mentality comes from it's yeah. like as a college athlete you are required to push through because they are paying you to be there so yeah but i'm a kid i'm, I'm a kid i don't i'm not a college athlete right now you're saying me as a eight-year-old yeah then, i mean that's true did you did you ever look at him and say dad this is playground time <laughs> no <laughs> even when we were playing it was it was there was a lesson embedded there was it was serious like mm-hmm. you know it wasn't you know just fun for the sake of having fun now my mom on the other hand she is more like that like you know so she's the balance for that yeah in that way but i, I think my dad had a overarching Effect like you know now that they're separated, she's much more leisure, fun, mm-hmm. you know, go with the flow. Mm-hmm. But I didn't feel that during my childhood, and she was the primary caretaker because my dad was always working, mm-hmm. and so it felt like it was coming from her. But she says, I mean, now I know that it was coming from him. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I forgot why I started mentioning that. Oh, are you injured or are you hurt? Mm-hmm. So yeah, I never, one, felt like my body mattered, really, um, or like how I felt about things. I never really felt like it mattered. I would sometimes sacrifice my own feelings and opinions in an effort not to be what I per- perceived as disrespectful. I am judging you. <laughs> <laughs> You're making me feel like I wish I was your friend back in the day. I would have been like, yeah. look, look, let's, yeah. let's talk, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, like, these are the things that are in- ingrained in me from, like, let's say my earliest memory of my being or who I am is like eight years old. This is what I carried with me. And honestly, that upbringing probably groomed me to successfully navigate the medical field, which is pretty toxic. <laughs> like, I mean, if I'm always suppressing how I feel and what what my body needs, then that's perfect, especially if you're going into something like a uh, surgical field or, I mean, just medical in general. Like, and it's, well, you, you, have to, you have to sacrifice and defer wants for the greater purpose, which is like becoming a doctor. So how how did you learn to get in contact with the things that you've been ignoring for most of your life? Uh, It was by force. So like I always had this underlying like dissatisfaction with my life. I thought, oh, we're moving all the time. And so I never get to make friends or keep friends. Maybe that's why I'm not happy. 
Then I go to college, same college for four years, and I'm still unable to like keep friends. And I feel I still don't feel like I'm seen or valued really. Um, then I I'm like, okay, well maybe when I become a doctor, then I'll be happy. Then I go get to med school, I become a doctor, I'm still not happy. Then I'm like, maybe when I get in a relationship, then I'll be happy because that person will love me, no matter who it is. <laughs> Then I got into a relationship and this was back in like 2019 and I felt worse, like worse than I ever felt through that entire time. And it's because this person was not a person that was genuine or like really cared about me. Um, I refer to him as an emotional catfish. Um, he said to me one time, like, yeah, I just said, I just told you that I loved you because um, I thought that's just what people say. That's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. That. <laughs> wow. Wow. And so at that point. Can I shoot you? I was. Huh? Can I shoot you? I'll be like, can I shoot you? Where's my gun? <laughs> Give me a second. Just take your time. Just stay right there. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, at that time, I couldn't really um, express my feelings. It was more. I was way more passive aggressive back then and way more just like cutting people off like I just don't talk to anymore or like you know um never really sharing how I felt but I knew at that point it was like okay I have to get out of this like this this relationship and it only lasted for like nine months or something like it wasn't very long girl even if it's nine months something that's important that's happening right is lasting forever yeah it was it was a huge change even though he was an emotional catfish and he made me feel worse than I ever had in my entire life it was a catalyst for me to start therapy. So that was the one positive thing that came out of that. He said one day, like I was telling him how I felt and how sad I was and everything. Didn't know why I was sad, just like was sad. Um, and he was like, yeah, you need to see a therapist. <laughs> and after that, I went and got a therapist. Um, but he was never supportive or like, um, like he never was emotionally supportive or um, even kind really he used to always like mock me or like make fun of the things that i had or did not have so like i'm in residency i'm going to be a doctor i'm going to be something but all he could do was say like for instance i had an old leather jacket that i got from forever 21 because that's what i could afford and it was kind of stylish but it has started to peel and he was instead of saying oh let me get you a new jacket or you should get a new jacket or you know let's fix this it was like ha, you wearing that old ass jacket like you know yeah <laughs> just like jokes on jokes on jokes and honestly that felt familiar to me because that's how that's who my dad is like they call it jiving back in the 60s and that's how his family treated him and that's how they treat each other and so that's how i was raised by him my mom's family is not really like that um but she never really she never really stepped in stepped in or or corrected that when we were being raised so i i just thought that's how people communicate that's how you show your friends with somebody or that you like somebody and that's what you would recognize from the world when you have it right yeah yeah um and so this person that i was dating was like the exact same um but it didn't feel good to have that all the time um so anyway after he told me, I just said, I love you because I thought that's what people say. I was like, yeah, we should break up. This isn't working out. Um, and that was hard for me because I actually did love him. Mm -hmm. But then you know? here, I got to cut this off side step to Right. Hey, exactly. Don't be afraid to move on to another side because this is not just dirt. That's something special because this works well on everything. So if that black self's not coming out, I'm like, you know. You, you said the rest focus of the on the stain that no, you've been looking at. No, no, no. I saw that and then I realized, I said, no, that stain's not coming out. Because, like, look, I was watching you do it, and I'm like, nah, she's doing a great job. And that don't want to come that's out of the material. Gonna be, you're going to need some that's not, a, that's not a you thing. <laughs> that is not a you thing. Uh, yeah, we need some different angles. Okay. I like, I like how we just took a different spin on that topic. Nah, you, you can move on. That's not you, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just no, Lord knows that is not you. All right. <laughs> oh, mothers. 
<laughs> so um so yeah after that relationship i started uh listening to brene brown mm-hmm. he, brene gonna get you brene brown, yeah. yeah brene gonna get you um <laughs> and just like her i think the first thing i watched was like her stuff on shame and vulnerability and i realized like wow i have a lot of things that i'm shameful of like you know but things that are not that big of a deal mm-hmm. because everybody has experienced it. But in my head, it's like the worst and I can never share that with anybody. And so I, I realized that that was interfering with my ability to connect with people because I'm holding a lot within. And so to the outside, it probably looks like I am detached. I am, uh, I don't have feelings. Um, I am perfect, which nobody wants to connect with somebody that's perfect, right? <laughs> like, or that appears to be perfect. I, you must be doing some work because that's not what I got from you. I got at some moments you may be in the past working back to the present, but not perfection. You, you're doing your best. Yeah. I mean, this is me now. Yeah. I'm taking you through my theory. As I yeah. said, as yeah. I said you, you've obviously done yeah. a lot of great work. Yeah. 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 You feel what I'm saying? I got you. I got yeah. you on the up. <laughs> yeah, you met me at a good time. I got you on the up. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yeah. First, identifying that yes, I had a lot of shame. There was a book called. It was by Brene Brown called "I Thought It Was Just Me." Mm. Um, hey, what a title right exactly and yeah. it, I mean it sums it up perfectly like yeah I did think it was just me when I was in college I had an episode of um, alcohol alcohol poisoning with those. which I was just a college kid who never really got out in high school yeah um, and, and I was just alcohol poisoning right and I was just trying to like See turn up it was my birthday yeah. I was trying to turn up and what they doing over there also trying by drinking trying to numb my feelings of sadness and unhappiness i thought that's how you connect with people that's how you make friends like in college it seems like that's what everybody's doing you're making friends by partying and you know going out and stuff so but i i held a lot of shame around that for a long time because my mom was so heartbroken and shocked and appalled by the fact that i was even drinking underage um, in college, right? So, so I felt like, oh wow, I'm, I'm wild and I'm out here <laughs> living a crazy lifestyle. But no, like a lot of people and a lot of people go through yeah. that, you know. So you're supposed to explore. Um, That's the safest time to explore, technically. Technically, yeah. So, so yeah, that unlocked. That was the first door that was unlocked. By reading it, it, I thought it was just me. And then um, I started looking for a therapist because this is also when the pandemic happens, right? So now the world is shutting down, but I'm still going to work because I am an essential worker, right? Terrible. (laughs) And in DC, it was a great time. Like the parking enforcement was not out. You can park wherever you want, how long you want. You can go to rest. Well, you can order breeds. Yeah. And they sit in your car. Exactly. There was no traffic. It was it was great. Yeah. Um and it gave me a lot of time to reflect. Headspace was free at that time. And so I used that time to learn about meditation. So Headspace the app. The app Headspace, yes. yes. Uh Um, would you would you like to tell us more about this app? Yes. Uh so it's an app that has guided meditations and also kind of just like in encouraging messages or like you know i used to get like a daily affirmation from the headspace app and so that that really helped me see life differently um and then i realized like how negative my thinking was and how bad i was feeling was probably easily corrected by therapy so i actually started seeking a therapist through my um what's it called Employment insurance. Assistance Program, EAP. So that's different from insurance. There is an insurance component, but it's like your employer will provide mm-hmm. a therapist. Mm-hmm. I think you get five sessions free of charge or something. Like that. Okay. Yeah, so I did that. Um, that therapist wasn't, the first therapist wasn't great. And that's commonly how it is. Like you have to go through therapists 
probably three or four before you find the one that best suits you. This is a gorgeous egg or believe it right there. You just keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I finally found a therapist that helped me a lot. She helped me identify my feelings. I feel like all those years of suppression, are you injured or are you hurt? Mm -hmm. All of that led to me kind of just like not acknowledging, not even learning the language to identify my feelings. So looking at a feelings wheel, this is what my therapist did with me, looking at a feelings wheel and having me pick out exactly which one. Yes, I am overwhelmed or I am angry or I am sad. I used to think that saying that I was angry was disrespectful to my, because if I was angry at my mom, then that would be disrespectful. So <laughs> just learning that it's okay to say that you are angry you know, it, it was life changing for me. Um, and being able to say it to another person, mm -hmm. like, hey, this made me feel this way. I found that that led to way more connection. Um, and then the other thing that my therapist, my first therapist helped me, or my second therapist helped me do was to recognize my distorted thinking patterns, right? So, Let's pause right here for a second. Okay. Girl, you make me reflect on how I was raised and how I grew up. <laughs> and everything you be saying be making me think, maybe I was a rebel in my own little way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. you gonna say whatever the hell you gonna say, but what I'm actually gonna do yeah. and the path I'm gonna follow yeah. is not, that's not good advice. <laughs> and I don't know where that comes from. But, but man... <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm listening to you talk. Oh. I can't believe we just became friends. Now, don't get me wrong. I think I'm a better version of who I was back in the day and everything else. Mm -hmm. But, like, you shouldn't be teaching. You should teach someone, are you injured or are you hurt? That's actually very important for when you're competing. Mm -hmm. That's important for when you have a goal and the mindset that you need to get to that goal. Yeah. But every second, minute, hour, and day of your life is not going to be spent towards that goal. Mm -hmm. There are times you're going to have to take a shower. There are times you're going to take a bubble bath. There are times you're going to have to figure out, hey, is my ankle mm -hmm. sprained? Mm -hmm. There are times you're going to be like, hey, am I eating correctly and really thinking about this correctly? Right. Because what that does is your habits in life follow your mindset. Yeah. And that translates to so many places. So, for example, well, well, what are, if you can think about it, what are three places that you think, am I injured or am I hurt that showed up that were toxic in some of your relationships? Whether it's with other people or with yourself. Because mm. I'm not having that. I'm hearing you saying that. And I'm just like, she needs a hug. I did. Yeah. 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 Um, in my relationships. Either with other people or with yourselves. So I think in my relationship with my mom, honestly, mm -hmm. like, you know, there are a lot of times that I just let her do or say whatever without ever saying like, hey, that hurt me. Or like, you know, uh, trying to fix the issue or trying to change the way that we interact. I just kind of like sucked it up, maybe disappear for a few days or weeks and then came back, which like, that's no way to have a relationship, especially with your mom. Like I actually, I like my mom. She's fun to be around, um, but we just are different people. And so we clash sometimes, um, or it would used to, we used to clash a lot and she didn't know she was offending me I didn't know I was offending her and then there's just this like toxic cycle of miscommunications um, and then also with our thinking errors like I learned some of my thinking errors from the way that I was raised which she had a part in so like you know that causes a lot of miscommunications and disagreements too um, so I, I would say that's the place where it had the biggest effect because again like if I'm saying I'm angry at something that she did, then that's disrespectful. And so can be disrespectful because then that's just going to snowball into something else, right? Um, so yeah, I think in terms of like 
like when I went into surgery, that was one place where are you injured or are you hurt manifested too? Because like you this mean is getting into the craft of surgery that you were practicing, or you I think had to go to surgery for yourself. No, 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 into the craft of mm-hmm. practicing surgery. I think um, just being in that environment that was pretty toxic. It's like you know, all white guys, uh, all men. Um, I guess white guys and men. That's the same, but. I mean, just these all men are white, so that's true. Know. Yeah, um, but it was the white guys that made it toxic. Just like I am not to be heard, and I'm barely to be seen. It's just like I'm not even acknowledged as a person. And if I really want to prove that I deserve to be here, then I have to accept that and still try to outshine the other people that are on my level. Like, you know, whether they are white men um, themselves or even black men, you know, like it's, surgery is not a place for women. Um, and actually somebody told me that when I was in med school, like, yeah, it's an old white boys club. You're not gonna make it. But that was a battery in my back. That wasn't like, oh, maybe I should listen to him. It was more like, I'm gonna prove you wrong. Cause this was coming from a white man. Um, Oh, we love proving white men wrong. Let me tell you something. <laughs> I went to go get some food with my boy yeah. the other day, and this drunk white dude had ordered like a bunch of stuff, and mm-hmm. his friend was like just sitting there unbothered, watching him be a white mess until he collapsed, right? Mm-hmm. Now he collapsed and folded against a wall, drunk and drooling, mm-hmm. right? And I looked at him and I said, oh, that is not a good situation. Yeah. And when I said that word, I feel like his friend all of a sudden got this fire in his chest. I was like, you're not going to let this black man laugh at us. Get get Uh up. Get up. Get up. Get yourself together. (laughs) And I said, what was this gusto until now? Yeah. And when when we got into the car with my boy, I was like, you know, his buddy wasn't really talking or moving like that until he saw me laugh. Right. Yeah. It was like, I wonder where that comes from. <laughs> Shame. <laughs> Embarrassment. Like, you know, yeah. like, you know, how dare this big black guy who was inferior yeah. laugh at me as if I'm inferior. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to give him a reason to laugh at me right. on this Saturday before I got to go to church on Sunday. It happens. They go to church? Sometimes. You know, church is where they do most of their politicking. I did not know that. I thought that for black deals, people, yeah. A lot of deals get cut in church. Okay, I heard the golf course, but that too. Church is the. Well, church is convenient. Oh, okay. You know, you can stay focused. Yeah. And also, church services are relatively short on that side. Not yeah. a lot of long church services. Yeah, I've seen that on TV. Never been to one, but um. I grew up in a Catholic church. You did. Yeah, my mom kept me in a. Uh, private Catholic school all the way up to college. Okay. She was like, you know, you're in the system, might as well keep it going. Then I ended up going to the Catholic University of America and I saw a lot of deals get cut mm-hmm. in church. Mm-hmm. You see how white your sneakers are? Your sneakers have gone through a transformation. Don't look at the front. Your sneakers <laughs> have gone through a transformation, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they are transforming. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like me as a person. Mm-hmm. So, um, so yeah, I mean. Another example. One more. Mm-hmm. One uh, more of. Are you injured or are you hurt? hurt? I mean, I don't know necessarily in relations, but literally, like, mm-hmm. I am competing in the track meet, the championship track meet. It's the four by one. We are in the finals and during the warm-up the grass was wet and i slipped in hyperextended my hamstring so i couldn't compete um and my dad like he just kind of was like oh yeah you're gonna walk, like brush it, walk it off like you know i maybe went to patient first like the urgent care but never got like a rehabilitation or anything or physical therapy or anything like that, which that probably would have helped because after that, it was hard for me to run. You know, I like I just wasn't the same. Did and no I don't one, even think I participated in the track season the next year. Did no one ever think, hey, let's get her checked out? Or was it so just suck it up and go that no one could see past the mentality? 
Um, Cause Pops was there, so that's not really a you thing. I'm hearing a pop story on this side. Oh yeah, but I accepted it. I see a lot of kids today that will advocate for themselves. Like I need to go to the doctor. I just would just kind of like this generation mm-hmm. different, girl. <laughs> <laughs> You're a reflection of your environment. You feel what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. I mean, like, I went to pay. F- I went to an urgent care, I believe, mm-hmm. and I believe but I had know. crutches. And but I did go to school. It wasn't like I get to stay home from school, even though I can't walk. Did you know about the concept of rehab at that point as a child? Um, I can't remember. The answer I, is no. Most of us don't know what the hell rehab is until we uh, edge ourselves as athletes, I and see. the doctor says, yeah. "Hey." You yeah. need to rehab this. Yeah. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? That's that's an education and environment moment. There's a difference between what you're responsible for within the limits of your knowledge, right? Right. So now you know, <clears throat> not because you're a doctor. I mean, you are a doctor. That's not yeah. the point of the convo. Yeah. That's when it's the adult's responsibility or right. maybe the guardian's concern to step in and say, hey, yeah. are we missing something? Because if I demand that you perform or I demand that you do your best, yeah. I need to look at the equipment, which is you and your body and say, hey, yeah. are we giving this person and the equipment they're using the best chance to accomplish this thing right. correctly and yeah. not just because we want to see W's? Yeah. Okay, so that was my dad. Yeah. But then fast forward three years, I'm mm-hmm. ice skating, like, in Philadelphia, and <clears throat> I slip and fall and hyperextend my other hamstring. Oh, God. And so the Were first you super experience... flexible like that? Yeah. Okay. Because I was like, man, you're doing a lot of hyperextensions left and right. I think because I was not flexible, that's why I hyperextended, ah, right? Yeah. I don't know. You were stretching or anything like that? No. Track folks are usually taught to stretch. Yeah, but you do the basic, like, five stretches, and then you go ahead and you sprint for the rest of the two hours Ah. that you're... (laughs) That. (laughs) Uh, But in college, because of my first experience, I was just like, yeah, I'm just going to, like, you know, suck it up and limp through the campus of Temple University. (laughs) What year was this? This is my junior year. So, so this is like 2010. Oh my God. I was going back and forth between Catholic University and Temple at the time you were there. Oh, you were? Yeah. Wow. That's so crazy. Yeah. I, I was going back and forth to Temple from like 2008 mm-hmm. until about 2012. Oh, I was back and forth between DC and Philly. Yeah. We were in Philly at the same time. I was yeah. there from 2007 to 2000. <clears throat> 2012, actually, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what an amazing combo. I know. <laughs> We're filling back the onion layers. <laughs> onions. Right. Lots of onions. <laughs> Who would have thunk it? <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess that's that's one example. That's the third example. Were you running for Temple's no. team at that time? You just strictly school. Just strictly school. Okay. Because I was part of a, um, like a, uh, summer research program mm-hmm. that was based on Temple's campus since middle school. And so I got a scholarship to go there. That was the same one you referenced in the other interview. Right. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Should I connect these two interviews uh, or just keep them just separate? Keep them separate. Just, okay. Just right, cool. I just, separate. Yeah. That's like, I'll, I'll snacks now. <laughs> since we're on the topic. <laughs> I got you. Yeah. <laughs> Say so, less. So, um, yeah, I forgot where I was. Um, Hyper extension, ice skating. Oh, yeah. So I just ended up sucking it up like, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, I'll, I'll get over this. And, you know, that was the beginning of the weakening of my legs. You know, I think mm. everything else was a trickle down effect from that because if your hamstrings aren't strong or flexible, then your calves are probably working in overtime. Yeah. And if you don't stretch on top of that, then your Achilles is definitely getting strained. Yeah. Um, and so I would go through these periods where I would like, run two miles every day and then like month month long periods of like i don't work out at all um and i'm so i'm sure the back and forth of that probably led to the um, injury of my achilles you got to stay consistent right yeah yeah um so yeah how did you learn to love running no i i never loved it (laughs) my dad actually 
So when I was a when I was a freshman in high school, we were in Chicago and I joined the basketball team. That was my connection with my dad and my brother is basketball, you mm -hmm. know, like, so I just joined the basketball team. It was a horrible experience. Like the coach was trying to run us and train us as if we were D1 college athletes. Mm -hmm. And that just has never been me. Like and your body's never developed up to that yet. Right. And yeah. I'm a, I'm a pretty athletic person, but mm -hmm. I'm just not professional. Like that's just never been my personality. I don't care that much. Um, and I don't like to work harder than I have to. So, like... Define the, that. <laughs> I will do mm -hmm. the bare minimum to get what I want. So, like, if they say you need to get a 91 to get an A, I'm getting a 91. I'm not getting a 100. <laughs> you are. That is it. Thank you for coming. Appreciate right. y'all. If they say you could be good, if you... Mm -hmm. You know, get a A or B. I'm get, probably getting a B plus. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not gonna try to be that much of an overachiever. Although in my, you know, where I am in life, I kind of am an overachiever. But mm -hmm. it's by doing the bare minimum it takes to be considered that. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I'm not the person that's going to the library reading all the books for fun. Mm -hmm. It's like I just I, I'm trying to learn what I need to get a good grade on the test. Those people are scary to me. No ones that are reading the books in the library for fun. <laughs> like, so you were in the library for fun. Like, for funsies. Because you like learning. Yeah. No. When people are like, yeah, let's go to the museum. I'm like, why? I, I love learning too, but I'm more interested in the things that are happening in the subject matter, not the subject matter directly. The things that are happening in the subject matter. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? So, for example, in IT, uh -huh. IT is fascinating. Sure, it gets the job done. But what's more fascinating is CloudStrike shutting down half of the world and what led to that and how it relates to IT. Yeah. So, policy. Yeah. What policies could have been implemented? Mm -hmm. Okay, structure. Mm -hmm. What other programs did you run that program through? before it got sent off to all those networks of all those other systems. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, where was it tested? Uh -huh. Do you guys have a precaution against this? If that precaution failed, all right, what other company is involved in that precaution? Mm -hmm. All right. Why did that precaution fail? Was there a fail safe that overrided the fail safe just because business? Yeah. All right. Why is business playing a part of something being sent out safely yeah. that won't shut down everyone's systems that makes millions and billions of dollars? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And why was that allowed? So is it about profit and protecting your clients or is it about making sure that money continues to come into the building? Yeah. And what part does that play in IT in itself? And that to me is fascinating mm -hmm. because money really does dictate everything, whether people want to admit it or not, whether it's healthcare, whether it's finances, whether it's politics or sports, mm -hmm. it's everywhere. Yeah. You like to get to the bottom of things. Yes. Yeah. And then when I get there, I'm like, okay, well, how do we get back to the top? Because <laughs> getting to the bottom is only a quarter of the race. Yeah. Getting back to the top is the other quarter because then you get to see who did what on the way to get there. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you need to have to sit down and discuss, well, how are we punishing these people correctly? Because mm -hmm. if you say I'm punishing you and the punishment doesn't scare me or put the fear of God in me or the people around me, I'm not is it really this. punishment or is it just the word punishment? Right. Yes. Yeah. There's a lot of words. Yeah, but they mean things when people are quietly sitting down in their little libraries, drinking alcohol, trying to forget about who's about to punish them the next day. <laughs> yeah. It's <laughs> just honest. Uh, yeah, so um no, I don't think I feel like that about anything except probably hair. Okay. I think hair is my real passion. So maybe that's maybe that is why no, I only do the bare minimum. Coming back. We keep coming right. back to this hair discussion. Maybe that's why I only do the bare minimum. It's because I'm not, I don't really care. You like, need to start a platform called Hear Me Out. Hear Me Out. Uh -huh. I like it. From the hair? I like it. Yeah, you could put a blend of your two knowledges between being a doctor and a therapist and together when it comes to this mental health stuff. And yeah. just, you know. Hear Me Out. That might yeah. be the show. 
Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm just saying. Put that in my back pocket. That's okay. all you. you do with yeah. that what you will. Let me know how I can help. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> He won't charge me for the person. No. <laughs> hey, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I've never been so proud of someone I just met. Aww, I'm like, girl, I'm proud you. of you. Thank you. Because what you told me about that relationship, look yeah. dude, man, I have a yeah. lot of women friends. Yeah. And let me tell you, that story you told me about what he said and how he said it and mm-hmm. what led there. Yes. The way someone treats you in your relationship is very, very important. Mm-hmm. There, if I hurt somebody in my relationship, there needs to be fear before I say what I'm going to say, even though I know it's going to hurt their feelings. Right. Yeah. That man didn't have an ounce of fear in his heart. No. You should use the big brush for that side, too. I mean, you're doing a great job piece by piece. Don't get me wrong, but the big brush will help you out. See, and that's that's proof that you really like the finer details of things. That's I what that is. Yeah. That's yeah. that's a, I'm a very detailed I person. Don't, don't mind me. Yeah. But it's like, nah, the bigger brush will help you get through the rest of that. And then you can use the little brush on, you know, the, the actual parts. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Um, but that also plays out with your personality. I do like, pay like attention to the someone, details. Yeah. For someone who said, hey, man, I'm here to do the bare minimum. Your bare minimum does not look like the next person's bare minimum I've seen. Because your bare minimum is, is very... Look at that. Yeah. Look, look how far you got. You could bring the other sneaker up to show us how far you've got it. The before and after. And that's, um, that's something I'm realizing, too, is that, like, even when I'm not trying, I'm still better than a lot mm-hmm. of others. I mean... Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Let me show the size. Look at that. Look at that. How about that? How about that? Look at you go. You see that? that mm, it's distinct. But for me, Juice, here's the problem. What's up? I don't see that. Darn. I don't see the difference. Well. And that's I, that's one of the reasons why I think I'm doing the bare minimum. But no, actually, I'm, I'm overachieving. Well, and you also, uh, you need to have friends like myself, which mm-hmm. you're working on. Mm-hmm. And other folks to identify like, but look at your hard work. Right now, this conversation is giving... Simba, you own everything that the sun touches. <laughs> and you, you keep looking at the dark space, and I'm like, hey, don't look at that. <laughs> don't look at that. Simba, stop looking at that. That's, that's what this is giving right now. Yeah. See, look, I mean, you got the same thing done in a different way. You see how quick you just did that? Yeah, I did. Um, yeah. Another lesson learned from my father is um, no matter a job, big or small, mm-hmm. do your best or not at all. And so it, it made me always, even if I don't want to, mm-hmm. I'm trying to work towards a standard that probably doesn't exist. So like, you know, if I do my best and he doesn't think it's my best, then it's not the best. And I need to do it in a way that he's going to acknowledge does that make sense yeah it so. does but that's where we differ yeah um so i do say the same thing mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. do your best mm-hmm. in my relationship my partner and i we have an agreement that hey all i'm asking for is your best like right. even with her having chronic pain mm-hmm. the approach for being in a relationship with someone who has chronic pain is very different from the approach of someone who is very able body because mm-hmm. someone in chronic pain they're not going to tell you when they're in pain because they're already trying their quote unquote best right so technically when you're with them you got to be able to sense hey my g did mm-hmm. you know you're in pain today right and it's on its way do you not hear the train tracks rumbling in the background her and i have a bunch of those conversations mm-hmm and you know she'll be like well how did you know and it's like well when you're around somebody long enough and you're paying attention to them you're gonna just pick up on those things okay and then she'll lay down and she'll be like dang i am in pain and i'm like yeah you didn't need the bed for that you just yeah needed another person to pay attention and not be in your situation to show you what you got going on and what you're doing or give you permission to be in pain Mm -hmm. like you know, it goes back to, are you injured or are you hurt? Like, yeah. You know? Yeah, that's the title. Yeah. That's the title. It's just, it's just, that's the title at this point, right? <laughs> <laughs> that, that is the title. Um, 
Yeah. So, but also the other half of that is you doing your best isn't measured by other people. It should only be measured by you. Yeah, but that's hard for a child to mm -hmm. internalize. Like, if you do your best and then they say, I think you could do better, mm -hmm. then it's like, oh, wow. I'm not talking I mean, about kids, I'm talking about you now. Well, everybody's walking around with their inner child. Oh, yeah. That doesn't ever go away. You guys argue? Um, you and your inner child? I don't like to argue with anyone. No, I'm talking I about mean, your inner child. I, I, I argue with my inner child. We be. I don't argue. Scrapping. That's I'm a, yeah. I'm a person that rationalizes or like maybe debate is debate arguing if if i was your inner child i'd be throwing stuff at the wall and be like no. i you could go ahead and not argue with me i'm just gonna no. push the plate of spaghetti off the edge of the table and see what happens see my inner child was afraid mm -hmm. to be angry so like it's really a calm and maybe also too like mm -hmm. Since I've learned how to identify my feelings, yeah, I can have a conversation with my inner child before they get worked up. Like, hmm, let's look at this from all perspectives. Mm -hmm. Do they really not call back because they hate you? Like, no, they are busy. They have three kids. Like, yeah, you know. Or um, so it never gets to a point where it's uh, it's a like, battle of resistance. It's more just like rationalizing with the inner child. Um, which I, I realized since yesterday, cause I started work, watching this show called Couples Therapy. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of it? I heard of it. I haven't gotten into it yet. I'm, I'm on the fence. It's these, on this season that I'm watching, there are these two men who are discussing their Trump traumatic passes or traumatic pasts mm -hmm. and one of them was sexually abused mm -hmm. and suppressed. Yeah for decades and the other just experienced well not just but experienced homelessness and um just being gay and how that affected him but he was always allowed to express himself and so their inner children fight differently like the one who was sexually abused because he was suppressed for so long when he gets angry it's like no coming back he dissociates he's saying things that will cut to the core he is like destructive okay. The other one is more like, um, well, we just have to get through this. We cannot wallow in this negative place. Let's just try to find the happy place. Mm -hmm. um, and I realized that my inner child is probably more like the second one than the first one. I just get, I still get uncomfortable with anger, but at least I can acknowledge it now. You know what I mean? And even for my inner child, it's the same. Um, <laughs> But I forgot where I was going with that. Well, I have a good question for sure. you. Sure, yeah. Okay? Yeah. Um, what difference did believing in the words that represent your feelings make? Literally. So, for example, <clears throat> saying I'm angry. Right. And actually understanding what anger feels like. Mm -hmm. And what that did to you. Or I'm sad. Um, because I was walking around with a entanglement of emotions that just felt like a knot in my throat or like a pit in my stomach and it would lead to tears. If someone asked, why are you crying? I could not say why I was crying and it, it didn't lead to any type of like resolution. It's just kind of like, you're so emotional or like, you know, like. Being able to say, I am angry and identifying why I'm angry helps me communicate to whoever or whatever is making me angry. This is the thing that tick, like pisses me off, like don't do it again. And then it helps me decide like if they do it again, is this something that I want to continue to deal with or is this something that I can remove from my life? And it leads to more happiness and detanglement of all that stuff. So um, I don't cry as much as I used to. I mean, I really don't cry at all, except if like I see something sad on TV or anything, but it's never because somebody did something to me and I cannot explain why I'm feeling the knot or feeling upset. Um, so that's how that helped me being able to do you cry a lot from things you see on TV or you just have moments like, oh, no, it's coming. Um, and then I you probably... can wipe the bottom of those off when you're done. I probably cry a medium. Job. Thank you, Juice. I probably cry 
a medium amount. Like, I wouldn't say I'm crying all the time, but I'm also not just like, I don't cry. What is this? Yeah. I don't, I don't do that. Um, but before, I used to cry too much, I think. You know. Um, too much in the way that, like, it was just crying with no, no understanding or explanation of why. Um, you so ever seen that meme with the African guy and the lady running down the street? And he's like, why aren't you funny? Why are you running? I haven't. I need to send that to you. Because yeah. I heard you saying that, but the why are you crying? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think I also was taught that crying, mm-hmm. I think like a lot of black people, that crying is a weakness. And so I used to always feel shame about the fact that I was always crying. Mm-hmm. And the people around me were always like, why are you crying? <laughs> and I'm like, I can't help it. <laughs> So that, I mean, that probably still lives within me deep down, even though I try to like, for the people that I'm around, I do try to acknowledge and normalize it. Like, hey, you have emotions, like it's okay to cry. Mm -hmm. My inner child probably does not agree. So So it's like, it's okay to use the big brush for the larger part of the story. Yeah, but but juice, I used the big brush Uh and this part was still dirty. So Mm -hmm. now my face- Is this the old one or the new one? This is the old one. So is the sneaker you haven't cleaned yet? This is the one that I am cleaning. This is yeah, the one no, that I, I started with. So that's the one you started with? Yeah. All right. I was like, man, when you, I thought you switched the sneakers. And no, I was, I like, was just trying to compare I was like, why does that one look so clean? It's just <laughs> dirty. I was like, I was confused. I, you didn't see it in my eyes. But I was like, man, that, that sneaker looks like it's been cleaned already. Yeah. But but didn't she just switch them? Yeah. Because you got to remember, on my side of the camera, I'm switching between your face and the sneakers. So oh, it's like, okay. you know, I'm looking up So and you down can really see the, the change. Yeah. It's like when you're in something, you can't really tell. Nah, the, you, you've the... transformed that sneaker quite a bit, yeah. buddy. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Um, Great job. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? See, look how much dirt is in the water. Oh. Weird. Yeah, that thing was clear earlier. Remember, I get I handed you a clear cup. Jeez. That is like brown to I wish I was black. I feel right? like this is a metaphor for my life. Like, wow, look how far you've come. But in the moment, I'm just doing the steps. You yeah. know, like well, that's that's usually what the process is like. <laughs> you could wipe the table off before you start on the new one. That'll make it easier for you to see the difference. There you go. Quality towel that I will be washing you tonight. Good job. Good job, towel. There you go, towel. I want you to slow mo that. <laughs> <laughs> slow mo what? <laughs> I'm gonna cut just that clip and I'm gonna send it to you. Then I'm gonna have the wipe me down song in the background. Oh, I'm gonna wipe me down. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So, okay. Mm-hmm. I can identify my feelings, I can communicate them. Mm-hmm. Um, the next thing that I started to work on with a different therapist, cause my time ran out at that job mm-hmm. with that therapist, my Does insurance. that suck when that happens? You gotta like, let go of someone that you've made so much progress with. Yeah. It did. Cause you, you feel a certain sense of comfort, mm-hmm. like, but then at the I same time, me? but at the same time, mm-hmm. I did feel like I had started to outgrow that therapist. Oh, um, and okay. so it was a good time to make that change. Because my next therapist taught me how to value myself. Oh. Like, yeah. Okay, so one therapist broke the seal mm-hmm. on your perspective mm-hmm. of valuing yourself. Right. And overcoming the are you hurt or are you injured right. mold. Mm-hmm. And the next therapist said, okay, now pick up the pieces and what kind of glue are we going to use? Mm-hmm. Okay, tell me about yeah. that. So I was working in a new job mm-hmm. and I, it was my first job after finishing my, you know, decades of training. And so I really haven't had the opportunity to like negotiate a salary. I don't know what other people make. Um, I'm kind, But I do know enough to know that I need somebody to negotiate on my behalf. So I hire a lawyer. Mm-hmm. Um, Is that usual? I don't think a lot of people know that when they're coming out of training. Um, but I had gotten advice from somebody who had graduated like a few years before mm-hmm. me. So could you let them know what kind of training you were in? I was in a residency train, like a 
I, I think this is common for all residency trainings, like to become a doctor. To be, oh yeah, to become a doctor. Yeah, you just yeah. gotta say that. You know, they yeah, don't, they yeah, don't know yeah, you. Yeah, you know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, That's yeah. what I'm yeah. saying. So yeah. when you finish medical school, you are a doctor. Mm -hmm. When you finish residency, you are capable of practicing independently in a specialty. So whether it's surgery or pediatrics or ob or uh, orthopedics or whatever it is, you need a residency in order to be able to do that. Uh -huh. um, can you re-specialize? Yeah, there are people that do multiple. So like if you finish residency and you feel like you want to hone even further your craft, then you can go into a fellowship. So uh -huh. that's like a residency, but like, you know, they give you credit for the time that you've already spent learning the basic stuff in resident in like a residency program. Mm -hmm. And so you're called a fellow where you get to just focus on like, let's say I wanted to be a fellow in uh, uh, pediatric heart or pediatric cardiology. You would do your pediatric residency and then you would do a fellowship in cardiology that focuses just on kids. So it would be like at a children's hospital, you will be working with kids who need help with their heart. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And then what, you can do as many fellowships as you want to. Once you do one residency, I don't think, unless you quit a residency and like switch into a totally different field. Like if I went from, you know, pediatrics, after I finished pediatrics residency, if I said, I want to be a ob -GYN, like you can't just go into an ob -GYN fellowship. You have to go and start mm -hmm. over and do a whole ob -GYN residency. Yeah. Uh, residencies usually range between like three, the minimum is like three years the maximum is usually like about five years. Um, so five years to understand your craft. Right. Okay. But if you take off time for research, then it could be up to seven years. Cause you, sometimes people don't, um, don't do research within the residency training. They take separate dedicated research time. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, that's just a little bit of background on the medical training pro process. So, um, I'm starting my first job after residency and I was just happy that I, I got a higher salary than what everybody was telling me I could get, um, overcome another hurdle. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So like, you know, I think people, I think people accept what other people can get as their own destiny. Like, you know, oh, someone's only got you know, this certain, this $140,000 salary, that's what I'm going to aim for. But for me, my approach was I'm going to think about what kind of life I want to live. So do I want to travel twice a year? Do I want to buy a house? Um, how valuable do I think my skill set is? Like I'm not many pediatricians have also done a year and a half of surgery training. So like that brings another level of expertise to the table. I freaking love it. I said I wanted to make $200,000 a year. I did not get that, but it, it uh, empowered me with the ability to say no to the, to the offers that everybody else was excited about. Like, oh, 140, like that's not even close to what I want. So like, no, I can't accept that. Anyway, so I finally got the salary that I wanted, but the terms of the job were borderline abusive. I was gonna say, hey, talk your shit. Don't anyway it. You, yes. Sorry. I, I'm sorry it was abusive. Don't get yeah. me wrong, but yeah. don't don't in any way you're accomplished. Thank right? you. You Thank paid you. for a lawyer. Yeah. You got close to the number you were I looking for. I got closer for, to the number. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, it was an abusive. Right. What's that? Is that a foundation structure system? What would you say made it abusive? The I think the. I think the structure. <clears throat> so like. The structure? Yeah. So they wanted me to travel between two offices. Is that common? Mm, no, especially not for someone who just finished residency. I, I realized mm -hmm. shortly after that, that like, I'm not even prepared to be on my own, really. Like, yeah. I still need to be able to consult a colleague and say like, hey, what do you think about this? Or like, you know, just running my ideas past another person mm -hmm. because when you think about it after you've completed a residency program you just have three years of experience on the job and now you're supposed to be an expert like did you have any mentors in the space that could have advised you against that or looking back it was kind of every man for themselves unfortunately um uh, i think what i wanted differed from 
what the people in my environment could offer. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, they talk about being in academic medicine. I have no interest in research. Yeah. I don't want to work with trainees really. Mm -hmm. And so everybody that was around me were the people that were doing research or working with trainees. And so when it comes to like, what do you think about this job position? They don't really have a reference because a lot of them went straight from residency into the same academic program that they graduated from. That's like kind of the culture. Like mm -hmm. you just stick around. Um, and I was trying to do something a little bit revolutionary because I wanted to work with uh, underprivileged children. Um, which has always been your focus. Which has been my focus, at least since 2016. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, God, no cap. Um, so they wanted me to go between two different offices. They wanted me to work the most. So, like, everybody, I was probably one of three pediatricians. The other two pediatricians maybe worked... 20 or 30 percent of the time that I was there but not like I was the main person I was always there um so it's coming back to a black moment this feels like it's coming back to a black moment no this was a this was a, a Spanish this, like this was a diverse organization this wasn't like just mm -hmm. it wasn't just no no I got you uh, I got you I, I got you yeah <laughs> no, I, just, I, did. I, did. I really don't think race was involved even my my immediate supervisor was black so I, mm -hmm. I really don't think it was that um, but she was old. I was going to say, skin folk can't right. care for right. right, yeah, she was old. <laughs> yes. And she was probably tired and looking for, like, fresh mm -hmm. new blood to, like, take over and work most of the time. Yeah. But does running the fresh blood into the ground... Right, yeah. Yeah. Um, and on top of that, so, like, we were saying before, if I am scheduled to see 10 patients in the morning, that is with the understanding that some of them will not show up. But at this job, I was scheduled with probably 12 patients in the morning and all of them will show up because of the culture, like they're going to come to their appointments. Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about running someone down to the ground and I'm working every day, yeah, you know, it, it just was not sustainable. And then it also wasn't necessarily the exact patient population that I wanted to work with. It was a Spanish immigrant population, which, you know. Spanish people who are American, that's one thing. But Spanish people coming from South America or Directly. Central America, it's yeah. like one, you don't really speak the language, two, you don't have money, three, you don't have insurance. So all the things that I've learned in my training, I cannot apply because you're worried about the cost. And in training, they teach us not to think about the money. So like, you know, we have opposing, um, goals here reality versus right exactly yeah. yeah and that was just very difficult for me i never had an interest in global health so that's what that job really was um but anyway my therapist at that time helped me to negotiate and say like hey i don't think i'm ready to be on my own and this is what i need so being able to articulate that i think that was huge for me knowing that I am valuable, even if I cannot do exactly what people are expecting or asking me to do. Like mm -hmm. that was important. Being able to identify when people are trying to take advantage of me. That was uh, something I accomplished with the, the next therapist. Um, and then being able to just like write down what makes me feel loved, doing that for myself so that when the next partner comes around, I can identify that that's the right partner and I won't make the same mistake. That's how I feel. Five years later, I'm still single, but I'm still hopeful that the right one, and I, I do believe that the right person will come into my life. Mm -hmm. um, I just have to be patient because when I've tried to force things, it was a disaster. It was a, you know. Yeah. Also, your framing is different now. Right, yeah. Like, you know, what 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 sis is gonna accept? Let me tell you something. I ain't, we, ain't, right. we ain't accepting the same right. cakes no more. That's exactly. it. Yeah. yeah. It's like I mean I need to be able to provide at least what I expect somebody else to provide. So like if I want that person to be able to or if I'm expecting that person to take me out to dinner or to cook for me, mm -hmm. I need to be willing to cook for myself when I'm single. Like, you mm -hmm. know, you can't expect somebody else to show you love if you don't even know how to show yourself love. Yeah. That's what I feel. And then there's also the other side of like, what if, what if the person doesn't do the thing at all? Like right. For example, there's certain relationships where 
one person does all the cooking and the other person is like, all right, well, you know, I'll be doing all the cooking. So I need to know what you went into and what you're trying to eat. Because okay. if I'm doing all the cooking, I'm not going to be the originator of all the ideas of what we cook in. That's crazy. Yes. Yeah. All right. Chef Boy Army is in the kitchen. What we doing? <laughs> <laughs> I think, too, the other thing is I would always settle for people that were just interested in me, but not necessarily on the same level uh, emotionally, mm -hmm. intellectually, career-wise. Mm -hmm. And so I need to set the standard that, like, I'm adding I'm adding value to your life. What value are you adding to my life? Like, yeah. you know, can I bounce this idea off of you and can you give me some constructive feedback that's going to propel me forward like i can't have somebody mm -hmm. that's just like yeah yeah you're great you're great you're great you're doing way better than i did you doing way more than i could do it's like no we're not here to compete <laughs> yeah we're not we're not yeah. here to compete that's, that's or even the fact that like you not even com competition but mm -hmm. just like you have not even experienced half of what i have experienced or accomplished for myself and so yeah. you just think everything that i'm doing is great like yeah. i just need somebody that's going to give me honest feedback like hey these are the ways that you can improve. Yeah. Get yourself this microphone with this camera. Like, you know. Hey, 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 I came with that list. I said, hey, this is you. I said, this is you. I saw some cameras last night, and I was like, oh, she might want that. That looked like a nice fight. I was like, oh, that got a Bluetooth app, so she don't got to get out. I said, shoot, I might get me two of those for myself. Right. And it's like, hey, you're throwing this event. Have you considered consent forms? I need that. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I can't be the only one coming up with ideas. The other, um, the people who care about the things that you care about as much as you do. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so I started building friendships that kind of reflect or mimic uh, or model, I should say, mm -hmm. the type of romantic partnership that I, I want. And that, and that has changed my life experience. Like before I was so unhappy and always just feeling disconnected. But now I feel like I'm surrounded by people and connected to people that genuinely care about me and I can reciprocate that. Like they feel that I genuinely care about them as well. I have questions. Yeah. Is it jarring when you first build a new genuine connection? Like, is there a fear of, I hope to God this connection works out or is this what care is supposed to feel like? Um, it's not jarring because mm -hmm. I know it's not just me. Yeah. And I've already identified qualities in you that align with what I'm going for. Right. Mm -hmm. So like, I'm not just giving every, you know, person that I meet my phone number, like, Hey, let's be friends. Hell it's no. like, we kind of like talk shit at the bar for an hour or two. And it's like, hmm, yeah, we got a lot in common. Like, yeah. yeah do you want to hang out later? Like, let's just see how it goes. I'm not yeah. putting so much weight and investment into, you know, random interactions, mm -hmm. you know? Even the way that we met, it was kind of just like I put myself out there mm -hmm. and I was met with the same energy. And so that was a clue like, oh, yeah, this person might be somebody that that um, will be a positive force in your life, if not friend. So, like, you know, I I'm, I think I, one of my talents, one of my skills is being able to read people's energy mm -hmm. in a short amount of time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, I'm very excited for who you are. Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy with who I am, too. I think before yeah. I did, um, I did kind of hate myself. I was I was embarrassed. I always felt like there was something wrong with my personality or, um, you know, I'm too shy. I'm too sarcastic. I'm too petty. I, like, you know, I had all these negative things I felt about myself. And one day I just like, you know, in my therapeutic journey, I just rolled down like all the things that I am that had nothing to do with how I look or what I can do for people. It's just like, you know, I'm funny. I'm generous. I am. I mean, I guess being generous is like something you could do for a person, but you're very charismatic. That was not one of the things I wrote down, but thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I am loving, like when I love a person, I'm a hundred percent in like, there's nothing that I will not do for that person. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm fun to be around. Like before that, I kind of wondered, like, do people think that I'm fun to be around? Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm happy with the person that I am. I wouldn't change me 
And also I'm, I am okay with the things that I experienced that were negative in the past. Like, you know, all of that has made me the person I am and it, and it gives me the superpower of being able to connect with quote unquote broken people or like people that are struggling Mm -hmm. in the ways that I have struggled. So I think the first mistake that we make quite often and actually got this advice from care was we make the mistake of thinking that we weren't broken already in terms of how we read ourselves and what it is that we go through. And we start to think, am I broken instead of thinking, well, how can I work on who I am now and what's going on with me? Yeah. And we're so busy trying to pick up the pieces to make ourselves whole, but we were never really whole to begin with. Right. And there's something to be said about coming to terms and being okay with that. Uh Uh-huh. You know, something that I realize is that nobody's perfect because nobody has perfect parents. And you're broke. Like, you're, you're going to have to deal with your parents' shit. Like, yeah. you know. <laughs> also, I wouldn't want perfect parents. That's not what I fell in love with. That's not what you fell in love with? Nah. Perfect nah. parents? My parents. Mm-hmm. My parents. I love my parents for their blemishes. Mm-hmm. No matter how much it upsets me or... Mm-hmm. I look back and some of that may be associated with something negative, but Mm -hmm. blemishes usually start because people are trying. And sometimes they try so hard that they're not able to pay attention to the entire picture. Mm -hmm. And that's what leads to mistakes where you could wipe off the... uh, Oh, yeah. There you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there we go. Great job. Great job. You look at you go. Slow motion. (laughs) Just wipe me down. I I said wipe me down. Now for these, though, since they're directly on your feet, are you sure you want to clean the insides? I feel like just sticking to the outsides because you don't want to walk around in soggy slipper. Yeah, I was just going to do the outside. Okay, cool. I I had to say that out out loud before you guys like, oh, wait, wait. You've had a long day. I don't think driving home in soggy slipper has ever been a highlight for anybody. It's not that far. All right, cool. <laughs> um, so, what are the name of these shoes? These are Birkenstocks. Mm-hmm. Did we ever get the name of the first shoes before? These are. I feel like we Brooks. We, I think we started out talking about Brooks. Yeah, yeah. Right? Before the cameras are all, we just we had that discussion. All right, there mm-hmm. we go. Brooks, right in there. Good job. Brooks. Look at that clean job. <laughs> and these are some moccasins. These are Birkenstocks. This Birkenstocks. This is their, are they considered moccasins? You know, am I mistaken right no, now? No, moccasins mm-hmm. are they are based in Native American tradition. Oh, okay. See, now yeah. I feel like I done yeah. crossed the wrong line. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so what makes this? Is this a slipper or a sandal? This is a sandal. What makes this sandal special? Oh, when I have this sandal on, mm-hmm. I am relaxed. Okay. I am not. I don't care about how I. Mm-hmm. Let me let me think about what I'm going. Girl, say it raw. It's okay. It's not even. I don't care about how I look, but mm-hmm. it's just like, you know, I am not in work mode because one of the things about my job is like you're not allowed to wear open toe shoes. So if I have my toes think, out, that do you think that's nice. a good rule? Yes, because people mm-hmm. bleed, they mm-hmm. vomit, they mm-hmm. spit, they and a lot of like, things are transmitted through yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. a that's a good rule. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You might you might step on a needle. Oh. You don't yeah. Mm, people you really know. don't get rid of their stuff correctly or maybe a patient tore something out and kept to move in. All right. Yeah. So yeah. you might have to get better material for the top of your um bricks then, because you know, that's some soft <laughs> material up top. But I'm wearing a if sock. Ever, I'm wearing a ever, sock too. And I, I, I'm just saying. I'm, I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. But anyway, <clears throat> the Birkenstock allows me to have my toes exposed mm-hmm. and I really prefer to be barefoot mm-hmm. unless I'm on sand. Okay, barefoot uh-huh. mommy. Let's go in the building. <laughs> Let me just say barefoot in the house. Mm-hmm. Um, and also nice grass. I okay. Like barefoot. You like to be grounded? I do, yeah. Okay, so okay. Like, I think that's one of the, the uh, traits that goes with my... Uh, Zodiac, not just the fact that I'm a Pisces, but also Pisces like to um, be grounded. Um, I think it's where your where your signs were in relation to the moon, mm-hmm. the sun, the planets, all that stuff. Because mm-hmm. my mom recently got me a a book 
it's called the birthday book oh, and so it goes through such like a great title it goes through like for me who <laughs> was i should probably shouldn't have said my name me who i'm just gonna cut that out was i was born mm -hmm. on this day at this time in 19 you know whatever uh-huh this is where all the planets were and this is what it means for your life and so mm -hmm. one of the things in that book which you know i don't think my mom is really into ast astrology like that um, one of those things was you like to get pedicures because it keeps you grounded. And I was like, how they know that? <laughs> <laughs> You're caught, man. <laughs> Who's watching me? <laughs> You're caught, man. I'm exposed. And I'm like, yes, I, I actually do. Um, part of my wellness plan is, or wellness routine is like, I'm going to get pedicures at least once a month, if not mm -hmm. twice a month. Um, and I don't even have to get color on my toes. It's really just about the person massaging my feet and washing my, um, you know, just cleansing, cleansing my feet. So, yeah, that's why I like the Birkenstock because it makes me feel relaxed and grounded. I could be myself, all versions of myself. We love to see it. We love yeah. to see it. Um, yeah. So, I forgot where we were. We're talking before, about the birthday book. Yeah, but before I switch shoes, you're being grounded. Yeah. Um, Comfort. These sandals represent. I do. I no longer care about what's going on today. We were talking about my job, the first job that I had. Ah, oh, yeah. Why is when we reached back there, I was like, we, we've moved on to a completely different topic. I was fixing the cameras. I was like, ooh, these angles. I was like, you tell me. Yeah. So, you know, after working with my therapist on like valuing myself and loving myself and mm -hmm. knowing what I deserve in my next job, I was able to negotiate even more. So like, you know standing tall on like what I will and will not do recognizing a good offer when I see it standing what, on business recognizing a bad offer when I see it mm -hmm. like you know um so yeah actually I, I do think we wrap that up I, I'm happy with who I am today and where I am in my life I'm just gonna let you brush things in silence and watch you work cause you're detailed for yeah. like two minutes. Definitely wouldn't recommend the big brush for these. Smaller space. Notice I ain't say one thing about a big brush when you took them out. <laughs> I said, now that's all her. Right. That's, that is all. She's doing a great job. <laughs> her bare minimum is somebody else's. I wish you would. I wish I had that in me. <sighs> What do you expect from an everyday shoe? Um, comfort first, then some, some style. Like I'm not going to be out here wearing grandma's orthopedic sneaker. You got it. <laughs> but I do want it to be comfortable. You know, one thing I hate is when I wear a shoe and let's say unexpectedly I have to walk a far distance and then afterwards I have like injuries whether it be cuts or bruises or soreness on my feet because i walked too far in those shoes like yeah so the birkenstock is a good one because you can walk long distance you can be at the beach or in the pool you can you can i even wear birkenstocks with socks during the winter because i'm just trying to chill like i just want to get in the car and go so i just slip them on as a yo from New Jersey, I know about that quite often. Yeah. <laughs> We've done the socks with sandals uh, mm -hmm. bit. I'm actually socks and sandals oh, right now. You Just, are. Yeah. I feel like black men, though, in general, mm -hmm. will wear Nikes, Nike slides and crew socks <laughs> to the court, uh, to the grocery store, to the airport. To our lady <laughs> in the casket. <laughs> <laughs> this is like a staple. <laughs> is that a black man in socks and slides? I think that is. 
<laughs> he must have basketball shorts under those pants. <laughs> that man is ready. He stay ready. Never got to get ready. <laughs> what a staple in the community. <laughs> in the community. Yeah. So. Okay. You are so detailed. I don't understand what not being detailed would look like. <laughs> don't do that to yourself. No, I'm serious. Like, I feel like I'm doing a regular, a regular job. Like, who wouldn't do it like this? And what would they do if they didn't do it like this? A lot of people wouldn't do it like this. Mm-hmm. That's that's not something. If I if I were to clean what you're cleaning, mm-hmm. I would have just turned it upside down. And I would have just focused on the bottom and then I would have turned it white right side up and I would have probably gotten some Lysol wipes, sprayed it a little bit, did a little wipe, make sure I got everything off till it went back to the color. And they're like, oh, this is good. This is good. Unless it has a heavy stain, hmm. then I would take out the toothbrush. Now, th- is that in itself detailed? Yeah, but yeah. it's like cosmetically I don't know what the water would do to it, but it looks comfortable. It, it, look, it looks like something you can wear in the rain. You feel yeah. what I'm saying? So yeah. it's not an issue. Yeah. But like, I also don't know what the original color is. Oh, it's this color. He's a relatively new too. See, um, you came in with the new stuff, but your feet said, hey, I might be new, but I've been working hard. Because you remember when you came in with the first pair, I said, oh my God. Yeah. You say, I just got these. I said, oh, your work ethic is what I'm I looking can... at. Got you. That's also part of loving myself because I mm-hmm. would have worn shoes down to the ground until the shoes stopped shoeing. And now I'm like, hey, I can just get new ones. They don't have to, I don't have to wear these. One of my boys, I just interviewed him, plays for a D2 program in West Virginia. Mm-hmm. And his workout sneakers that he brought to clean for his interview and mm-hmm. clean one of the pair of shoes. I think it's coming out tomorrow. Mm-hmm. He's had those pair of shoes since before college. Yeah. I was like, you can't, you can't tell me you're an explosive athlete and you're mm-hmm. not wearing your shoe down. So why do you still have this shoe? Yeah. He said, oh, these are the old faithfuls. I was like, boy, you're going to hurt yourself. Yeah. You're going to faithfully injure yourself <laughs> in them things. You're going to injure. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. And he's a great athlete. He just had a breakout year. Yeah, last year had a little mm-hmm. bit, like it was either forty something or fifty something tackles, mm-hmm. and half of his tackles were tackles for loss as a DN playing in a D two program. You murking people in old faithfuls? <laughs> yeah, either a lot of sports language at me and i didn't follow a bit of it oh i'm sorry <laughs> i i apologize but it sounds like he's a beast or whatever it is. Yes, he is a beast on okay. average d linemen don't usually get tackles over 30 mm. and if you get someone who's averaging 40 and up mm-hmm. you have something special like my junior year which was way better than my senior year where i um broke my fifth metatarsal in my foot I had That's a the breakout year. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I had a breakout year of 55 tackles and 21 of my tackles were recorded 15 to 20 yards away from the line of scrimmage. Mm-hmm. So that means that in half of my highlights, I was running past my teammates to tackle wide receivers as someone who was heavier than the teammates that I'm running past. You were getting them before they got a chance. Yeah. And usually receivers, once you're like 12 to 15 yards up, that person's at whatever their full speed would be as a wide receiver. Mm. So that means that I was able to accelerate in very short bursts to catch them. And this is when I had my stressed Achilles my junior Mm. year. Like I had stressed my Achilles right at the beginning of the year, Mm -hmm. racing someone in gassers. Which, looking back, is idiotic. What is gasser? That's when, gas? that's when you got to do the suicides. You touch one line, the other oh. line. Yeah. And you were like, racing ah. the person? Yeah. He was the fastest lineman on the team. Oh. And I said, boy, let me tell you something. You had something to prove. Yeah. He was uh, he was 6'8". Mm. And that was my height now. How tall are you? Just six. Six flat. Six, six feet. Yeah. I recently learned that that's taller than most people. What, no, most men, yeah. 
Yeah. From my perspective, because my brother is 6'3 and my dad is 6'3, mm -hmm. I think if you're not taller than that, you're not tall. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, ah, that's funny. Oh, wow. You're not 6'3, man. That's crazy. Well, look at you. No, Cute you're short. Look at you go. Regular. <laughs> <laughs> regular, regular over here. <laughs> I'm the shortest person in my family, but people would say that I am a tall girl. One I'm second. We're going to take a timeout right here. You said you're 5'7"? Yeah. You look tall for your height. Guys. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get to the flex part. You're like, oh, yeah, you know, it's just... Da -da -da. Well, just what? I just made a bedroom into a hair salon. Like, whatever. Anybody my, could do it. My G. <laughs> my G. We hear what you're saying, but guess what? Not a lot of people do. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Took um, my anybody. Somebody about to come in the picture. Like, hi, I'm anybody. I don't have that in my house. <laughs> um, I have my workout room. I have my art studio. Art really helped me process my emotions, too. I found that when I was really struggling with my emotions, I was way more... Um, like, I produced way more art. Mm -hmm. But when I'm thinking clearly and freely, Little. without stress or worry, I don't really have anything to put on the canvas. So that's, that's your good. that's your honest outlet then. Yeah, it is. And it's also a good measure for you. Yeah. Where am I? <laughs> yeah. But how to, am I feeling? Uh, how do you figure out what you're if you're going through a lot or not? Mm -hmm. You should just put up a video of you going into an art room putting a canvas on the thing, sitting down in the chair and look at the camera and say, I got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and then above it, you should just have the words, and this is the example of a good day, <laughs> right? Yeah. And then you follow up, yeah. go put the canvas down, Picasso <laughs> <laughs> throws the stick into the paint and look at the camera and say, yeah, it was a really bad week, man. It was a really bad week. Really it was a it. really bad week. <laughs> This is going through it. <laughs> just, just the hand extension. Yeah, I was going through it, man. I was going through it. Yeah, I feel like I, I, uh, my creative outlet now is my hair. Mm -hmm. Because I'm, I trust myself the most with hair. Okay. In terms of like, other people do not trust me with their hair. Mm -hmm. In terms of like experimenting and things, mm -hmm. and so I feel like, hmm, whatever. We're gonna try blonde today. If it doesn't work out, I'll shave my head. Mm -hmm. If it does, great. And so, you know, that's how I get my creativity out now. Let's put in curls. Let's put in flexi rods. Let's put in braids. Let's do twists. Let's, you know, experiment. Let's cut it. Let's grow it long. That's hilarious because that's kind of what led to me cutting my hair. <laughs> what? You went blonde? No, no, oh. no. I wasn't taking care of my hair. I have a rule, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it's a good rule to follow. Mm -hmm. If you're not able to take care of the things that you have raised, uh -huh. you need to let it go. That's a word. Right? <laughs> yeah. And with growing my hair, I think I started growing my hair around 2018, 2019, like summer of 2019, if I'm not mistaken. That's mm -hmm. when I decided to grow my hair because my barber messed my hair up mm. and I was like, all right, we're breaking up. And yep. then I was like, oh, this is just a great excuse to grow my hair. Mm -hmm. And then the pandemic happened and I was like, oh, this is perfect. I I owe nobody nothing but myself. I've always wanted to. Yeah. And then I came to realize that around this area, it was really hard for me to find someone who consi can consistently do my hair. Mm -hmm. so, like braided and stuff? Mm -hmm. Okay. So one of my homies who was doing my hair she would come through and do in-house, mm -hmm. like come through, do your hair, mm -hmm. clean up, keep it moving. Uh -huh. And one time she did my hair, it was like around my birthday or something. And my hair was coming out within 24 hours of her doing my hair. And I was like- Unraveling, you mean? Yeah. Okay. And I was like, that's not how this works. You don't, I don't pay all that money to get my hair done to be unraveling at the seams. Yeah. And it started unraveling at the roots and the tips. How? Houseway. <laughs> was she trying to like lock it? I can't. I can't fathom like how it was unraveling at the roots. 
And don't get me wrong, she didn't have her uh, blower that she would usually use to dry it. Mm -hmm. But whether you dry somebody's hair or not, it's not supposed to immediately unravel. Yeah. She was doing twists? Yeah. Oh, okay. That makes more sense. Yeah. But still, yeah, even still. with twists, they're not unraveling like that. No. And I don't remember if it was twists or braids, but I remember sitting there and asking my girl, hey, am I tripping? And she said, hey, you are not tripping. <laughs> And I said, okay, cool. And then yeah. I went to, to two to three other hairdressers, mm -hmm. folks that were doing my hair. And the one person who was like perfect at it, mm -hmm. her salon shut down because I think she made bad business decisions, honestly. But that's not what this is about. Yeah. And But also she was in school for other things and she put too many things on her plate. Mm -hmm. So I pulled up to her house for her to do my hair and she did an amazing job. Mm -hmm. But there was this one moment I was... She has like three kids, three mm -hmm. or four kids. Mm -hmm. There was this one moment she was washing my hair in her sink. Mm -hmm. And this far away from my face, when I looked in the sink, there was a fishbone. I was just chilling in the sink. Fishbone? A fishbone. It was like right here. And I said, Juice. You don't have this, to live like that. <laughs> is this who you've become? Have you become the man that needs to look at fish bones to get his done his hair done? And, and for you to look nice, fish bones, fish bones, juice, Jamaican fish bones, Mr. Juice. And I said, no, that's not, that's not going to work for me. I don't, I deserve better. I love fish. Don't get me wrong, but I don't like looking at fish bones in someone else's sink. That's just this. Yeah. So that was when I knew this journey of mine that's been very beautiful has run its course. Yeah. And I also came to realize I have hair that is trying to lock every chance it can get. Mm -hmm. There's something very annoying about hair that is always trying to lock, like always trying to lock. Well, you're Jamaican. Yeah, but you being Jamaican don't mean you built for locks. Like, oh, I thought... for example, my parents told me, hey, if you decide to lock your hair, you have to become a Rastafarian. Oh. You don't get to decide what I want to become, buddy. Oh. Wait. In Jamaican culture, the people that are wearing locks are Rastafarian? Oh, okay. They don't just have people with locks who are not. No. But in D.C., it would be acceptable. <laughs> My passport says I'm American. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My culture says I'm Jamaican. Oh, I see. You guys don't get to dictate what I decide to be in life as an adult, no matter how much you beg or whatever things you feel at the moment. Yeah. You can voice your stuff. Yeah. But I don't have to agree with you. You've been yeah. heard. You that's are, it. You are American. Your culture yeah. is Jamaican. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a, uh, uh, dichotomy mm -hmm. that's. I don't think most black Americans get to experience like it's not fun. Yours is not fun. It's not fun. It's interesting. Not fun. Because oh. like you don't you don't understand when it's time to stand up until you realize, hey, man, somebody's about to wrong you. It's time for you to stand up. Okay. Oh, okay. Which which one you decide to be today? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you get to be both. You know, when you go to Jamaica, you're a Jamaican. Yeah. And when you're here, you're Jamaican. But you're born here. So for me, it doesn't really count because, like, I blend in really well. I don't have an issue either way. Mm -hmm. Either I got my folks back or not. That's mm -hmm. what really matters. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to certain things, I didn't realize that it's not just my parents. Like, my cousins were like, hey, if you, if you go locks, you got to be a Rastafarian. Mm -hmm. It's like, um, you guys know what it means to be a Rastafarian outside of the diet, right? It's like a oh, whole I'm militant mindset when it comes to the men and women relationships and how you carry yourself mm. and what you expect mm. of your spouse and what they expect of you are you willing to make that heavy transition in your mm. life and who you need to be because mm -hmm. most people think oh that's the fine you just eat vegetables and fish and it's like no guys there's like a whole slew of rules to being a rastafari is it that rolls rastafarians are pescatarian for the most part not, not there, allowed to eat pork anymore, too. Is there a religious basis for that? Like... It's still Christianity, but it's more a militant form of it. Mm -hmm. so like Orthodox Christian? I, I, don't, I don't know the correct thing. That's why I'm not Because, you know, the, the seven, I think Seventh-day Adventists, they also have restrictions around, like, their diet and stuff. Yeah, but them folks be wilding. 
Tile for yeah. They don't need bottom feeders. Well, not not just that. That's hilarious. Not just that. <laughs> <laughs> they um, in that culture, it's more you're proving. For seven day Adventists, it's more of a culture that's built on proving you are the seven day Adventist. So oh. there's a lot of culture of sexual harassment and people being taken advantage of and when said folks are caught people are more willing to stay to the religion than support the allegation of someone being caught so like let's say someone has been sexually assaulted by someone or taken advantage of within the seven day adventist religion Mm -hmm. the way it's set up is you need one person you need more than one person to report this has happened to report the same incident or to to report two separate separate same incidents to the person and then there has to be proof of someone else knowing about it too Mm. so your word isn't just good as hey this person did this to me you need to establish a pattern you need to establish a pattern Mm -hmm. you need to have proof and you need to have someone else who says this too. Mm-hmm. And if you are in a culture that they're trying everything to stay to the religion and reporting someone they feel is against the religion, cause that would hurt the brand of seven day Adventists. Then a lot of monsters have a great playground. They could run around in. Sounds like Catholicism. <laughs> that too. Mm-hmm. That too. Yeah. Yeah. No, that too. Call them out. Say, <laughs> shit, I ain't, I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna say, Oh no, they was sweet. No, it didn't happen to me, but that's real. Mm-hmm. You feel what I'm saying? I'm not, gonna turn a blind eye because I'm in it or not. Nah, that's what that is. So it's just like, you know, being a Rasta is, if I ever decided to, that needs to be a me decision and me decision only, not a, oh, you're part of this culture. So if you do this, this means this. Mm -hmm. Since when have we ever all followed the rules? Yeah. It's only when you guys want to deter people, all of a sudden it becomes this serious thing that you have to be. And it's like, no, you no one gets to tell me what to do except for me and it starts with do i enjoy this or not that's right. it yeah. yeah and i wonder if your hair was soft like what was the feel of it hair? was really soft it upset my partner quite often how so because i would just have like brillo pad days and it just add some water to it right back to life yeah just easily yeah. and it's like as a woman, women go through a lot with hair. I understand you guys so much better than before. And I never, I never took the struggle you guys had for granted when it came to hair. But me having hair, I was like, like I cut my hair and it immediately brought it to the bad bitch that I always was. And I was like, well, oh, I forgot that getting a haircut was just that simple. Just get a haircut, brush your hair, keep it moving. <laughs> right? And having hair actually even my body out. So I'm a very big person just from being athletic and everything that I've done. My body has stuck with me. Like I go into the gym, they know what's up. That's why I wear hoodies and all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people at my job have walked up to me and said, hey, man, have you been working out? Oh, your face is better without your hair. And I'm like, guys, I was like, it's just the hair. They said, nah, you look. And I said, no, the hair evened me out. Now that the hair is cut, you guys have to focus on the rest of the body. And now that this is going and it's just this, you're immediately like, wow, I never realized how big and strong he always was around us. Mm -hmm. Plus the personality softens a lot of people. So it's very easy to look past it. I feel like you have a, not necessarily a strong Mm -hmm. personality, but it's hard to ignore. Yeah, I pick and choose who I, who I got to be for the days. Oh, okay. And I stick to it really well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And I enjoy people. People are very valuable to me. Yeah. Just in general. Yeah. I wish I would have had an opportunity to do your hair before you cut you it. You know, when I find out about all this stuff that you said, I was like, she was right there the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> the whole time. It would have been one of the best exchanges it that I've ever I'm going to love working here. I thought about that the day. I was like, did I cut it too soon? I was like, nah. But my hair has all the habits of when it was growing. So I noticed that my hair is standing up a lot more. Like I'll brush it down and my hair is like, now nah, we want to, we want to grow. And it's like, that was five years. I'm not going to give you another five years right now. Yeah. I'd rather get back into architecture and getting my job back on the other side of things. And then we can grow our hair after we're solidified. But right now I'm getting to the bag. 
Yeah. And I know how to keep my hair healthy, which is good. Yeah. Also, my hair attracts a lot of lint. That was another thing that was really annoying. So mm -hmm. the hair was locking a lot and it was trapping lint at a higher rate than before. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't know what's going on, but this isn't going to work for us. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. Who did you get your hair care routine from? Or did you like go on YouTube? My partner. Your partner? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, all the, all the hair stuff. Mm -hmm. Just my partner. Yeah. We talk about it. She yeah. buys some products. I have some gloves. See, look, I got my little old bottle, my purple bottle right there. Yeah. Put water in it. Yeah. You know, yeah. some hair products are around here somewhere. Yeah. Now they're like in the drawer over there. And I'm told I, right now I'm fighting with like, I don't want to stop my hair routine from before. But I'm like, I don't know if that's going to like help me with the waves. Because it's like, what if that hair product, like the Jamaican cast oil, the bio silk and a couple other things. What if that gets in the way of like. Just you can have waves and flat hair, and it's like, mm. nah, that makes your hair want to grow more, man. You know, mm. my hair might be on a different pattern of growth now because of that, but you, yeah. you know how it is. Yeah, you're using the bio silk, um, like heat protectant, or like what, what, bio uh, silk the like? silver joint, like the clear, the clear substance bio silk is what I usually use. Like yeah, this big, yeah. Oh, cool. So I'd use the um, water, Jamaican cast oil, bio silk. Then I'll use the Murray's, which is not in here right now. So that means it's in my bag. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I discovered this stuff called TGIN. Thank mm -hmm. God it's natural. Mm -hmm. Changed my life. Before that. Tell me more. I was Tell doing, me more. So before that, I was doing Can too, mm -hmm. which everybody who's newly new or mm -hmm. new to the natural journey, they That's where it starts. start with Can too. Mm -hmm. But it's coconut oil based. And mm -hmm. the coconut oil, which I learned in hair school, the molecules are so big that it cannot penetrate the cuticle. And so you're you're just coating your hair in this thing, but mm -hmm. underneath your hair is still very dry, and that's Ooh. how my hair felt. Okay. And I have soft hair. Yeah. And it also it looks like, soft. It looks nice. You came through today. I said, look at you. Yeah. Okay. I might slip and be on camera, so mm -hmm. we just had to. <laughs> <laughs> just in case, can't catch me slipping. <laughs> you thought. <laughs> <laughs> so then I um and then I also was using like shampoo and conditioner for when my hair was relaxed mm -hmm. which the relaxed hair has totally different chemical properties and takes in moisture and nutrients differently yeah. than the natural hair um and so I was on YouTube I've always kind of been on YouTube watching hair videos and I came across this girl who was using Aussie Moist, mm -hmm. which is a Walmart brand. I always thought mm -hmm. I was too good for the Walmart mm -hmm. drugstore brands, mm -hmm. but yeah, Aussie Moist uh -huh. shampoo mm -hmm. and conditioner. And then thank God it's natural. Mm -hmm. And when I tell you, like when my hair is moisturized, it is the most manageable. Like you can brush it easily. You mm -hmm. can curl it. It holds a style. You can slick it down, pull it back, put can it you up. Tell me that I need to look into these products. I thought it was about your journey, but I feel like you're giving me great advice right now. Okay, all right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I will be following up on this. <laughs> As I was listening, I was like, I feel like that applies to me. That that yeah. feels like it feels like it applies to but me. You keep saying your hair was locking, and mm -hmm. that that to me makes me feel like it was just dry. Because when the cuticle, when the hair shaft is um, dry, mm -hmm. then it kind of has a tendency to coil and yeah. also get locked in. Mm -hmm. That's why people also should clip their ends because the ends are just frayed pieces of the cuticle and so when it's dry it tends to lock and get more tangled you know what's crazy what i had like almost a full year everyone said hey next time you come back to me be sure to get your hair clipped but i would go back to them and no one would remember to clip my hair mm. and i'd be like does that mean the quality of my hair was so good it didn't need to be a topic or what's going on here because mm -hmm. like I don't know what I'm doing. It's just hair to me. Right. You guys are the experts. I'm paying y'all yeah. for what's going on. So yeah. when I finally got my hair clipped, I think it was like at the beginning of the year. But by that point, and my my other thing was I had like a lot of clothing products. I was holding on my hair because I wanted to do photo shoots. I think it's very unfair to grow your hair as a black man for four, almost five years and to cut it if you're not going to do a goddamn good professional photo shoot mm -hmm. with all the stuff that I have product wise. Right, yeah. But when I tell you it hit the fan for me, mm -hmm. I was like, I'm not spending money again to get my hair done. I'm cutting it. Yeah. And and even for her, I let her know, hey, the day I cut it, I'm not letting you know. I'm just, just know I'm going to come home one day and it's going to be gone. Yeah. That's it. Back to the fade. Yeah. yeah. And when I did that, her first sentence to me was like, see, now you have a curfew. <laughs> verbatim she's like 
She was like, she walked past me. She put her hand on the island. She was like, yeah, you got a curfew now, man. And she left. I was like, bruh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was that was the funny. Now, nah, she's super funny. That was yeah. the funniest thing she said. Yeah. But that day, she got me out the way. I was dead. I was like, wow. I was like, that's what it's like when they say, now nah, you have a curfew now. Dang, Juice. With just a little bit of guidance, she could have held on to your hair. Just. You weren't there. Oh, you weren't right there. there. You were there. At the Uno table. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> you were killing the Uno table, too. I actually. I um, obliterated my guy in Uno today. He did a good job, but we uh, played to seven games, and I think the final score was seven to five. I won. Mm -hmm. And it was like back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And the last three, I was like, the power of Dr. Jones, power of Dr. Jones, power of Dr. Jones. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I'm not getting murdered again. I'm not going out like that. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Okay. If you ever decide to to grow your hair again, let me know and I'll. No, I got you. Yeah. I got you. Yeah. I'm looking forward to how big we build the platform. Let's do the wrap up on this. No. In the meantime, okay. you can put the um, sneakers on the table. <laughs> yeah, that would be on this side. And before that, I just want to ask you one other question. Sure. What's two pieces of advice you'd give from someone who's suffering from the are you hurt or are you injured mentality? Oh, uh, it doesn't matter because neither one feels good. So do what's best for you in the end. Damn. <laughs> <It's the> <laughs> mess. <laughs> <laughs> Is that all the advice? Because I was like, hell of a mic drop. That was, that was a lot. I, mean, I don't know what else to add to that. Like, you know, putting you first. That Everybody else is putting themselves first. So you might as well do what you need to do for you. Mm -hmm. And looking back at how far you've come, what does being proud of yourself look like now? Um... I am most proud of myself when I do something that I believe that I cannot do or I'm not good at. So, for instance, like, I wouldn't consider myself a tech person. But when I created my website, even though I've got a lot of feedback about how it could be better, I was proud of that thing because I, I did the research I put 100% effort into making it what it was, and it looked like something presentable in my eyes. Um, and I don't, there aren't many things that I don't believe that I can accomplish. And so that's what looking proud of myself is for me. It's just like, I didn't think that that was something that I could do, and I did it, even if it's not like perfect or like, you know, the epitome of whatever the thing is, just celebrating like, Hey, I did that. And then showing other people, like, look what I did, regardless of what they may say or being afraid of, like, whatever their, their opinion about it is. Just being able to say, like, ta-da, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a day in my shoes. <laughs> <laughs>